Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. So prelims is just a month away and only 2.5% aspirants will qualify the prelims examination. So how to be a part of these 2.5% aspirants and how to have a short short way of clearing the prelims examination. Of course it is the knowledge and the understanding of the syllabus but it is the testing which is going to play a very crucial part in qualifying the prelims examination. And when such testing is at an all India level, amongst the most serious aspirants, that is the litmus test of your preparation. So to assess your preparation amongst the most serious aspirants and feel the competition before the real prelims examination, like every year we have come up with the preparation test. So how is the preparation test going to help you in fine tuning your preparation from now on till the real prelims examination? First, it will give you the all India ranking to understand your level of preparation amongst the most serious aspirants. Second, it will help you in understanding your weaknesses and strengths. And from there upon, you can devise a strategy for yourself for the next 30 days to be sure of qualifying the prelims examination. So this preparation test is scheduled on this weekend from Saturday till Monday. That is from 30th of April till 2nd of May. And this test will be followed by a live discussion on 3rd of May, which will be very important for you to analyze what kind of strategy you should pursue till this prelims examination. So register on the ELAN platform to appear in this test in large numbers. Under the weekly mains answer writing assignment, the question for this week is Highlighting the recent developments in India-Nepal relations, identify hanging issues and measures to resolve them. The answer has to be written in 250 words. Link to this question has been provided in the description of the video. Click on the link and upload your answers there which will be evaluated by Rao Zai's faculties. So the first news which we have taken for discussion appears on page number 1. Delhi should be under center's control. So the central government on Wednesday argued that Delhi, the nation's capital and a sprawling metropolitan, should be under its control. And this debate is with respect to a judgment given by the Supreme Court in 2018, where the government of Delhi went against the Union Government of India with respect to the interpretation of Article 239AA. And since 1991, when Delhi was given a legislative assembly with a council of ministers headed by a chief minister to aid and advise lieutenant governor in its functions, this has been a perpetual problem. And there are various reasons for this problem. There are of course constitutional provisions because of unique placement of Delhi in Union territory. But it's special because it is one of the two Union territories which have legislative assembly as well and that creates a problem. It creates a problem because union territories are supposed to be directly administered by the center. But at the same time, you have a locally elected council of minister and a legislative assembly empowered to enact laws on matters of state and concurrent list, barring public order, police and land. And that creates a conflict between center and Delhi government, especially when especially when both of these are ruled by parties belonging to the opposite side of the spectrum. And so in this discussion, we are going to understand the evolution of administration and its arrangement in Delhi through time. Then we are going to look at the constitutional provisions with respect to Delhi and what did the judgment of the Supreme Court say in 2018 because of which Government of India brought an amendment to the Act in 2021 and what are the issues. Let's now begin the discussion. Okay, so Delhi as we know it today 
has not existed like this in terms of administration since the time of independence. Delhi became a part C state, you know those categorizations of A, B, C and D in 1950. Then in 1951, for a very brief period of time, legislative assembly was created with an elected CM. But that lasted only for five years because all of us know that in 1956, State's Reorganization Act reorganized the whole country and in that process, Delhi became a union territory to be administered by an administrator who was appointed by president. And so, Delhi began to be directly administered by the central government and this continued for a very long time. Although some form of representative local government was provided to Delhi in 1966 in form of Delhi Administration Act 1966 which provided limited representative government through creation of metropolitan councils. That has continued even now. And so, finally the current arrangement started in 1991 when 69th Constitutional Amendment Act, which was based upon Balakrishnan Committee report, again created representative form of government in Delhi through creation of legislative assembly and council of ministers to aid and advise the lieutenant governor. So what is the constitutional scheme of Delhi? We know that various parts of the constitution of India deal with various aspects of administration of the country. So for example, part 5 deals with the union, part 6 deals with the states, deals with the union territories and as you can see, article 239AA, article 239AA carries special provisions with respect to Delhi. And so, there should not be any particular doubt in your mind whether Delhi is a state or a union territory. Delhi is a union territory with legislative assembly and with elected council of members to aid and advise the lieutenant governor just like Pondicherry. Whereas all other union territories do not have an elected council of minister headed by a chief minister and they do not have a legislative assembly as well. So what are the provisions of article 239AA? which was inserted through 69th constitutional amendment. So first and foremost, it granted special status to Delhi. Why was a special? Why is it called a special status? It is called a special status because despite being a union territory, which is supposed to be directly administered by the central government, it was provided with legislative assembly and council of ministers. And just like legislative assemblies of all the states are empowered to make laws on state list matters and concurrent list matters, even the legislative assembly of Delhi was empowered to do so. Except on three important matters, public order, police and land. And this has been the root cause of the problem between the Delhi government and the central government. Because whenever a party comes to power in Delhi which is different from the party commanding the power in the central government, it always leads to conflict because public order, police and land are one of the key and important aspects of governance. If a state government does not have police under their hands or the land under their hands, they will not be able to fulfill a lot of needs of the local residents. And that is where, when the confrontation first emerged when the Aam Admi Party came into power in Delhi, they went to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court decided the matter. And Supreme Court came up with its judgment of government of NCTD versus Union of India 2018, in which the Supreme Court first and foremost ruled that since Delhi was a union territory, all powers lay ultimately with the central government and not the elected government of Delhi. And so, it was a big boost to the claim by the central government because after all, this is what central government had been saying past many years. But there were other aspects to the judgment as well, which is very relevant for us to be understood. So apart from reinstating the claim of the central government, Supreme Court observed many things and it issued a form of principles in order to ensure the better governance and efficient administration of the Delhi. It said that Delhi government has powers in all matters except public order, police and land. And so the LG would be or the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi would be bound by the aid and advice of Council of Ministers just like all other governors except on those matters which are mentioned in the public order, police and land. So if the government comes up with some initiative in health and education, the Lieutenant Governor should have no problem and should usually approve that initiative. But if an initiative or a law deals with police or land, legislative assembly and council of ministers cannot do anything about it. But apart from this, 
The only exception to this rule is a proviso mentioned in Article 239 AA, which allowed the LG to refer to the President any issue on which there was a difference of opinion with the Council of Ministers. In such a case, the LG would be bound by the President's decision. Now, this difference of opinion can be related to police, public order and land, but they can be with respect to various matters and this is where the main problem starts. Since the Lieutenant Governor can have issues in any of the fields, under the matters of Legislative Assembly and Council of Ministers, he or she can refer any matter literally to President, which then ultimately will be decided by central government. And so this created a big problem. And so on all the matters where LG and Council of Ministers have differing opinion, neither LG nor COM can decide on their own, but that matter has to be referred to President. And so you can see that this particular judgment did not do anything exceptional to help solve this complicated situation. And that is why the Government of India came up with Amendment to the GNCTD Act 1991, which is known as Amendment Act 2021. And government gave two very specific reasons to come up with these amendments. The government said that there was no structural mechanism within the 1991 Act to ensure time-bound implementation of the rules of the Act. And also, the law gives no clarity about what proposal or matters need to be taken up with the LG before issuing an order. And so there was a time that these two things needed to be clarified. And so this particular amendment brought two important changes to the act. First, the amendment says that the term government in any law made by the legislative assembly shall mean LG. Whereas if you remember the 2018 judgment of the Supreme Court, it said the LG would be bound by the aid and advice of Council of Ministers in matters that were not directly under the control of LG. And the second important change which the amendment has made is that LG's opinion shall be obtained before the government takes any executive action based on decision taken by the cabinet or any individual minister. So now the LG's opinion has been made must even before the decision has been arrived at and all the references to the government would mean references to the LG. So indirectly, all the powers are now being transferred to the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. And that is why the Delhi government has again challenged these amendments in the Supreme Court. Apart from this, there are two other important aspects as well. For example, under the Amendment Act, Legislative Assembly shall not make rule to enable itself to its committees to consider the matters of day-to-day -day administration of the capital or conduct inquiries in relation to the administrative decisions. Any of the rule made in contravention of this provision shall be void. So the Legislative Assembly cannot make any rules and that is a big problem when it comes to the normal functioning of the Legislative Assembly. And finally, the LG will not assent to and pass on to the President for consideration of any bill which incidentally covers any of the matter which falls outside the purview of the power conferred on the Legislative Assembly. Which means that if LG feels that any of the law, any of the upcoming draft bill has potential to impact either public order or police or land directly or indirectly, he will not give assent to that particular bill. This has now been explicitly mentioned. So now this has created a lot of problems and there are a lot of issues with the act. First and foremost, centralization of the power in the central government. The act favors vesting real powers in the nominated LG rather than in the representative government. Then it undermines the representative form of the government. LG, who will now be the government, is under no obligation to implement any law passed by the assembly or carry out the directions of the house as he or she is not responsible to the assembly. Then it also goes against the much touted cooperative federalism principle of the central government. At the same time, it is also going to create a lot of roadblocks for the Delhi government. The elected government of Delhi will have to wait endlessly for the LG's opinion without being able to execute their decision. And hence there are high chances that the government could become dysfunctional in Delhi. And apart from all the facts, the act has been passed in haste without being referred to select committees and without proper debate. The next item of discussion appears on page number one again. Supreme Court fixes final sedition hearing on 5th of May. So the Supreme Court yesterday fixed May 5th for final hearing of the petitions challenging the constitutionality of the sedition law and made it clear that it will not brook any delay in the form of requests for adjournments. Now since last 5 to 7 years, sedition has been a very very important topic of discussion especially from the perspective of UPSC examination. 
Sedition in our country is governed by section 124A of Indian Penal Code which was first devised by the Britishers. And it was devised by the Britishers against the Indian people for keeping them away from any kind of rebellion activity against the British Raj. But it has continued to be in existence even after the independence and it has been used by both state and the central government sometimes correctly but oftentimes incorrectly used against journalists, civil society activists to curb the dissent. And that is where the misuse of sedition has come into play. And that is why it is important for us to have a brief look into what sedition means, what are the proper connotations of the law under section 124A, what are the various ways in which it has been applied so far which has led to a lot of trouble. Important Supreme Court judgments, especially Kadarnath Singh vs. State of Bihar and Kanahiya Kumar judgment and what are the arguments against and in favor of whether to keep sedition or not. Let us now begin the discussion. So before anything, let us just first understand the meaning of the word sedition. Sedition is a very particular term which denotes an act which is an incitement of discontent against the government or an act which leads to rebellion against the government or in other words any action especially in speech or writing which promotes discontent or rebellion against the government. Now that is problematic even in a democratic setup because in democratic setup the constitution of India lays down a procedure through which a government is formed and it also at the same time lays down the procedure through which a particular government can be removed. Apart from that, various mechanisms being provided in the constitution and law provide for enough safety mechanisms so that the government actions can be challenged. And so it is safe to assume that a lot of checks and balances have been provided not only within the institutions but also to the common public through which all illegal and immoral actions of the government can be challenged and can be stalled. And so the idea behind the sedition law is that if so many mechanisms have been provided in the hands of the citizenry, there is no need for the citizens to rebel against the state or against the government. Now the problem over here is that there is a very thin line between the criticism of a government or a state and incitement of discontent or leading to rebellion. And that thin line is where the problem and issues of uses and misuses with respect to the sedition law comes into play. And let us understand how the wording of section 124A of IPC, which provides for the penalty against the sedition, comes into play. So section 124A of IPC creates mechanism to check sedition in our country and you should be surprised to know that it was introduced by British Raj in 1870. Now the problem is not that it was introduced by Britishers because a lot of laws which we use currently have been introduced by Britishers but the problem is that it was introduced by Britishers in order to check the nationalist movement in order to arrest and send the freedom fighters to jail and that's where the problem lies. We are continuing with the law which was enacted to curb our own freedoms and since independence we have still stuck to the same law which Britishers themselves have repealed. So let us now look at section 124a and see what it talks about. Whoever by words either spoken or written or by signs or by visible representation or otherwise brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government established by law in India shall be punished with imprisonment for life to which fine may be added. So it starts with whoever which means it is applicable to anyone then the actions being committed by that whoever person can range from speech, drawing or any other kind of visible representation which either directly brings or which the state or the government thinks is attempting to bring either contempt or hatred or disaffection against the government established by law. Now these words are where the problems start. Although section 124 of IPC contains few explanations as well. So this explanation number one says that the expression disaffection includes disloyalty and all feelings of enmity. So whenever an action induces disloyalty in the citizens, 
the provisions of section 124 or the sedition can be applicable but there are two other sets of explanation which try to put a limit on the misuse of the sedition law which is comments expressing disapprobation of measures of the government with a view to obtain their alteration by lawful means without exciting or attempting to excite hatred contempt or disaffection do not constitute an offense under this section and similarly criticism of administration through lawful means shall not be considered as sedition so which means that let's say there is a scheme atmanirbhar bharat a journalist publishes an article criticizing measures taken by the government of india in the wake of covid-19 pandemic now that criticism as well as if the journalist or the writer of the article suggests some alteration in the policy and since she is doing it through lawful means which means that the article nowhere suggests the replacement of the government it just talks about alteration of the policy or government policy or the administration it shall not be counted in sedition so now the cursory reading of this particular section the provision against sedition will lead you to believe that everything is good and there is no problem and so why the fuss and to judge the efficacy of any law you have to look at its applications and now let's see few of the prominent cases in past 10 years and see how in reality the provisions of the section 124a have been used by various state governments starting with arrest of aseem trivedi in 2012 so cartoonist aseem trivedi was arrested in 2012 because he had published few cartoons on politicians then in 2012 and 13 we know that a lot of protests were going on in tamil nadu against the kudankulam nuclear power plant and the sedition case was filed against almost the complete village which was protesting against this particular nuclear power plant similarly recently in 2020 amulya leona was booked under sedition because she raised slogan pakistan zindabad along with various other countries names which she took then many sedition cases have been filed against the protester demanding revocation or reversal of citizenship amendment act 2019 so clearly we can see that as far as the use of sedition law is concerned clearly dissent criticism of government and questioning of politicians and government policies all of which are very fundamental to a democracy have come to be treated as sedition by police okay if this is the case then let's see how many of these cases which are filed initially lead to conviction in the same offense and so the graph which you see on your screen shows the number of cases related to sedition filed across the country in a particular year and which ranges between 30 and in 2018 it went up to 70 and so in general around 30 to 50 cases are filed each year dealing with sedition filing of cases are not important what is important is upholding of these cases by the judiciary that is leading to final conviction only then we will know that the sedition case filed by the police upheld the scrutiny of the judiciary and if you see that data it is dismally one per year in 2016 17 and in 18 one one and two cases led to conviction out of more than 60 to 70 filed that year which in itself shows that most of the cases which are filed failed to stand up to the scrutiny of the judiciary and why is that and that is because of the two important judgment one is kedarnath singh versus state of bihar and next one is kanhaiya kumar case the judgments given by the supreme court in both these cases act as a guiding light for judiciary in order to determine the case under 124a or the sedition law so this particular case took place in 1962 where the supreme court upheld section 124a and held that section 124 struck the correct balance between fundamental rights and the need for public order so the validity of section 124a was challenged and it was proposed that it violates the fundamental right but supreme court held that no it does not and in fact it is a right balance between the need for a public order we need laws to ensure public order and fundamental rights but the court had significantly reduced the scope of sedition law and what it did is that it limited the scope to only those cases where there is an incitement to imminent violence towards the overthrow of the state incitement to imminent violence so any speech action or publication which calls for immediate violent step against the overthrowing of the government or the state 
will attract sedition. Further, the court said that it is not mere against government of the day, but the institutions as the symbol of the state. So after this important judgment, now it has become clear that unless and until the speech which calls for immediate violent overthrow of the government of India or the state of India, except for that, except the police is able to demonstrate this imminent danger to the stability of the state, there shall not be any sedition case. And similarly, in Kanhaiya Kumar case, the Supreme Court redefined seditious act only if it had essential ingredients and it listed out three, disruption of public order, attempt to violently overthrow a government or threatening the security of the state. And now you can easily understand that why, even though the number of cases which are filed are 50 to 70 each year, but only one or two of them lead to conviction only because these two Supreme Court guidelines are on work. And now an obvious question which arises is that when the conviction rate is so low, why police even files the cases? And for that, we will have to revisit the provisions of section 124A. We know that this offence is cognizable and non-bailable. And so whenever the government is threatened by a publication or political opponents, as soon as the case is filed, bail as a matter of right is denied and for getting the bail, that person will have to first knock on the doors of the judiciary. And so what is guaranteed is few days, weeks or even months of jail term or police or judicial remand. And that threat is used to stifle the dissent or free speech. And that is why so many cases are filed even though they do not lead to conviction. And hence, prominent public thinkers have argued against this particular seditious law and called for its removal. At the same time, we know that this law is here to stay and there is no proposed amendment for this particular act. And so we'll discuss arguments for and against sedition law. So the first and foremost argument is that it is against democratic norms, just for the simple reason that it was enacted by the Britishers against the Indian people. It, in its basic nature, in its core, it stifles the democratic and fundamental right of people to criticize the government. And more often than not, it is used just for the same purpose. Then the next argument is the inadequate capacity of the local police stations to be able to judge the merit of a sedition case. We know that the cases are filed by the police and the police might not have the requisite training to understand the consequences of imposing such a stringent provision. They might not be able to understand the nuances of section 124a. It is very difficult to understand the difference between expressing disagreement with the government policy or expressing disloyalty towards the government and both can be mistaken and so we don't have such capacity of state machinery. Then just for the simple reason that it has been misused more often than it has been used. As we have seen with examples, it has been used arbitrarily to curb dissent. In many cases, the main targets have been writers, journalists, activists who question government policy and the projects and even political dissenters. Then, as the crime as we have seen is non-bailable and punishment can extend for life, it has a strong deterrent effect on dissent even if it ultimately does not lead to conviction. And finally, since this provision has been mostly used to gag the fourth pillar of our democracy that is the press, just this simple reason that most of the cases have been filed against the journalist is a strong enough reason as an argument and a strong argument against sedition law. But it's not as simple as it seems. There are some very solid points which indicate or which because of which the sedition law is still in existence. So against the argument that it is a draconian law, the people who argue in favor say that it is not really a draconian law anymore because now we have Supreme Court guidelines which have narrowed down significantly the jurisdiction of sedition law and it can be applied only on grounds laid down by the Supreme Court. So the draconian nature has been curtailed and so there is no need to dilute or remove it. Then for all those people who say that this particular sedition law violates the fundamental right to free speech, the argument can be made out that Article 19.1 provides for various kinds of freedom, but Article 19.2 provides for reasonable restrictions. And if you see, safety and security of India and any law enacted to preserve that 
comes under the reasonable restrictions and will not be void of Article 19.1. And so, sedition law is actually an application of reasonable restriction provided for in 19.2. Then the argument that it curbs the free speech also does not hold according to some people because the explanations given in section 124a have made it very very clear that one can use any kind of strong language in criticism of government policy schemes and actions without inviting sedition. Such freedom or dissent should not be turned into some kind of persuasion to break the country itself. And so that is why it is important to have a sedition law. And then one of the strongest argument comes from the existence of anti-national elements. In our country, we have terrorists, Naxals, who not only incite violence against the government, but also produce literature which tries to sow the seed of disaffection against the Indian state. And so, due to the presence of anti-national elements and divisive forces, such as Naxalites, separatists, it is important to have such a provision in law. And finally, for any law, the misuse can never be discounted, starting from anti-dowry provision to, to provisions to penalize the murder. All have been misused and mere misuse of a law cannot be ground for its repeal. And so in the mains examination, you could be expected to not only produce the arguments for and against, but also as a bureaucrat or as a future bureaucrat, come up with way forward or a solution. And so the way forward could be the continuance of sedition law, but incorporation of the Supreme Court guidelines given in Kedarnath case and Kanahiya case into the law. So article 124A should be amended to include the grounds given by the Supreme Court in these two cases into the act itself. Then there is a need for sensitization of the police or police training. They should be sufficiently guided as to where the section must be imposed and where not. And finally, there is a need to include provisions where the government can be penalized if the action, if this particular section is misused. This will ensure that section 124A of IPC strikes a balance between security and smooth functioning of the state along with fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression preserved. So this particular topic of sedition becomes very very important from the perspective of GS paper 2 where you could be expected to reproduce arguments both in favor as well as in against of sedition and is there a need to continue with the same law. So you will first start with a very very brief introduction as to what sedition means. What has been the controversial applications of this particular law which has brought this particular section into the news? What have been important Supreme Court judgments? and then arguments in favor against and then finally way forward. All of this compressed in 250 words. Let us now move on to the next discussion. So the next article for today's discussion is Indonesia's palm oil export ban which appears on text and context page which basically talks about why the president of Indonesia has banned the export of palm oil from the country and what are the various consequences it might have. Now from the perspective of UPSC prelims examination, this forms for a very very important discussion. Now it is important for us to understand that Indonesia is the world's biggest producer, exporter and consumer of palm oil. And that is why when this country comes up with such a ban, it is such a shock for the world. And the president of the country has done it so that they may be able to deal with the domestic shortages of cooking oil and bring down its skyrocketing prices. And this announcement has come amid already surging global food prices as a consequence of ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. According to the United Nations, food prices across the globe have risen around 13% in March, which is a big number. So why is it palm oil so important? Palm oil is the world's most widely used vegetable oil with its global production in the year 2020 being 73 million tons, according to USDA. As far as this particular year is concerned, it is expected to be around 77 million tons. It is derived from African oil palm and it is used as cooking oil and in everything from cosmetics, processed foods, cakes, chocolates, spreads, soap, shampoo and cleaning products to biofuel. So you can see how wide the application of palm oil is. So the obvious question is, why are the prices of edible oil rising? And just like any other thing, the prices are rising because demand has surpassed the supply. Demand increased because of the short supply of alternative vegetable oils. So not 100% of the vegetable oil across the globe is palm oil or its products. But there are various other vegetable oils which form a significant amount. 
and their production and supply have been reduced in past 2 to 3 years for example the production of soya bean oil the second most produced oil is expected to take a hit this year due to a poor soya bean season in argentina which happens to be the major producer of soya bean then another important vegetable oil canola oil and its production was hit in canada last year due to drought and supplies of sunflower oil which basically comes from russia and ukraine has been hit due to the conflict so you can see that how the production and supply of three of the major vegetable oils is impacting the prices of palm oil so how bad is indonesia's palm oil crisis and the crisis is even severe for indonesia because first and foremost the second largest producer and supplier of palm oil is malaysia and it is expected to observe lower than expected output this particular year we already know that alternative vegetable oils and their supply have reduced in this year and so indonesia is going to face a lot of problem because of which president has taken this preemptive action to make sure that there is sufficient domestic supply of this oil in his country so what are its impact on india india is the biggest importer of palm oil globally which makes up 40% of its vegetable oil consumption india meets half of its annual need for 8.3 million tons of palm oil from indonesia and so when indonesia is going to ban all the export from indonesia it's going to be a big problem for india as india is already grappling with record high wholesale inflation and combine that with the ban imposed by indonesia and in its oil imports and exports and on top of that indonesia has now banned all exports of palm oil from their country and so in the near future it is expected to result not only in short supply of vegetable oil but also would have its impact on massive inflation that we might be facing in coming 3 to 4 months energy independence through hydrogen appears on editorial page which talks about india's green hydrogen policy which was released in february 2022 now from the perspective of the coming prelims hydrogen energy and green hydrogen ammonia policy becomes very very important now hydrogen is important because now it is being considered as the silver bullet against climate change because whenever we oxidize a fuel to derive energy fossil fuel when combined with oxygen leads to release of energy but apart from energy it leads to a lot of pollutants being emitted into the atmosphere at the same time it leads to release of a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere which then creates problem for us and that is why we need a fuel which when oxidized release only energy and chemicals which are not dangerous to us in short and long term and what could be better than hydrogen because when it combines itself with oxygen it leads to the release of energy and the only product which is derived from this reaction is h2o or water and so you can see that not only we get energy but at the same time we get water and so nothing could be better than this but the obvious question is why are we not doing this and so we are not doing this because of various reasons first and foremost hydrogen is in very short supply in atmosphere unlike nitrogen oxygen which are present in plenty in atmosphere hydrogen is very minute in atmosphere but it is contained mainly in fossil fuels and the second best source of hydrogen would be the water if you break down water you are going to get h2 along with that you are going to get o2 the problem with the first one is that if you want to extract hydrogen again you are going to make sure that some of its component are going to be released into the atmosphere and the problem with the second one is that when you break down water into h2 and o2 you will require a lot of electricity and right now that electricity is being supplied mainly from coal and so if you break down water into h2 and o2 and again combine them to get energy you are not helping the environment and that is why unless and until you have significant amount of electricity supply from renewable energy sources you cannot have this functional reaction that is why government of india has come up with green hydrogen green ammonia manufacturers policy but before that let's have a look at various kinds of hydrogen you must have read about brown hydrogen green hydrogen blue hydrogen and green hydrogen and these are on the basis of the source and the processes through which the hydrogen is being derived 
Brown hydrogen is derived from the process of coal gasification that produces synthesis gas containing a mixture of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, methane and ethylene and it is a highly polluting substance. Whereas grey hydrogen is contained within natural gas, its production generates large amounts of carbon dioxide. It is the cheapest process today but it ultimately leads to release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Whereas blue hydrogen also produced by hydrocarbons but the emissions are captured and sequestered in the process and hence it is less polluting. Whereas finally you have the green hydrogen. It is created from the hydrolysis of water by means of electricity obtained from renewable sources like wind and solar. That is what we discussed. You break down H2O into H2 and O2 using electricity supply which is coming from solar and wind. So when you are creating hydrogen as an energy source, you are not emitting any kind of greenhouse gases or pollution into the atmosphere. And then you can utilize this H2 to power your transport system, derive energy and do whatever you want to do. And that is why government has come up with green hydrogen and green ammonia policy. All those processes and all those manufacturers who are going to produce hydrogen through green way and then they are going to supply it to ammonia manufacturers. Ammonia as you know is NH3 which again requires hydrogen and right now this hydrogen is either brown or grey. You need this hydrogen component also to be green so that you reduce or minimize the emissions into the atmosphere. So what are the various announcements by the government? So all those investors who are going to produce green hydrogen and ammonia, they can source renewable power from power exchange and other routes and they can set up their own plants as well. They are going to get open access to transmission within 15 days of application. They can bank unconsumed renewable power with power distribution companies for 30 days. Distribution companies can buy and sell renewable power to manufacturers at concessional rates. They have been given waiver of interstate transmission charges for 25 years. They will be provided connectivity to power grid on priority basis. Renewable purchase obligation incentives have been provided to manufacturer and distribution licensees. They have been provided with the single portal for all clearances. And so you can see a lot of steps have been announced by the government to incentivize green hydrogen and ammonia in our country. So this last news which we have taken up for today appears on page number one. State not passing on fuel duty cut to people, says Prime Minister. So Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday said that fuel prices were too high in some states ruled by BJP rivals and they were not passing on the benefits of the centre's excise duty cut to the people. And so it is important for us to look at two kinds of taxes which are levied on petroleum products. One of them is known as ad valorem and another one is a type of tax which is known as specific tax. And you should know that both of them are a category of indirect taxes. So when it comes to ad valorem tax, the tax rate is defined in terms of value of the product and not the volume or the quantity which is what is done in specific tax. It is defined in terms of unit of product. So for example, when you talk about 3%, 5%, 12%, 18%, 28%, 28 GST slabs, what you basically mean is that these percentages are applicable on the prices of the product. And that is what states levy. They levy ad valorem taxes on petrol and diesel. And that is why when you have increased in the prices of petrol and diesel, there is an increase in the collection of ad valorem taxes. Because if the if let's say the taxes are 30% and if prices increase from 100 to 110, the tax would increase from 30 rupees to 33 rupees. Whereas when we talk about specific tax, it is a tax levied by the center. So central excise duty on petrol is 27.9 rupees per liter. So irrespective of whether the prices are increasing or decreasing, this tax is going to remain constant. So when the prices of petrol or diesel increase, the specific taxes do not change whereas ad valorem taxes increase. But whenever there is an increasing demand of a particular product, for example petrol or diesel, there would be increasing collection for both ad valorem as well as specific tax. But whenever we have to talk about their contribution to inflation, you can understand that ad valorem has much higher impact on inflation as compared to specific tax. Because if let's say there is a 5% VAT on fuel and fuel price is 100, your total market price would be 105. But if fuel prices increase to 200 
and tax at Valorum is 5%, now the total market price would be 210. So you can see that it magnifies the impact of inflation because it is applicable on the value of the product. Whereas in terms of specific taxes, a 5 rupees excise duty which is fixed on 100 rupees fuel leads to market price of 105. When those prices increase to 200, the specific taxes do not change and hence having a much lesser impact on the inflation.